Մակուս պատիվից արվատգինը չվենի շենտեգի մոմխսանաբելի, ռոմելից կախլավտ պրոպեսորի Միխալ բուխովսկի, վիադրինաս էվրոպուլի ունիվերսիտետիս պրոպեսորի, ասավ էլ բոզնանիս ունիվերսիտետիս Սոցիալուրի անդրոպոլոգիիս � Մաս այն տերես էպ դայիստուր ագամոց դիլեպեպս կնիս ոստ սոցիալիստուրի ռիալովիս թավիսուպալի բազրիսադա դեմոգրատիիս գադակ ոտեպի բոլոնեցադա ծենտալուր այվրոպաշի։ Միսի ամժամին դելի կլավիթի կանսած մենտելի նեոլիբերալուրի պոստոցիալիզմիս անդրոպոլոգիա։ Չույն իրվել պանելսև իմս չել է թիմազարում սապջրթա տրանսիցիս թեորիզեպաս խշիրատ ախասիատեպս սազուգադոյպիս մոգալակեպիս դիկոտոմիուրի � որոմ ոստապջոտա մոգալակետա նացել սրոգոց մետեք սուբի եկ տեպս, ծալեպադի գարեմույապեպիս պիրոպեպշի, ախալի սիստամիստույս չեսաբամիսի ունարեպի աղմուաչնատը ստրապա չեծլ ես շոգորիմ դգոմարեո� իսինի պրոգրեսի սապիրիս պիրոմ խարիս աղմոչնդն են։ Ազոգի ավտորի ամգոր դախոպաս նեո որիենտալիզմը դաղծեր, սոտիսատ տամացխեպուլի մխար է, առացիվիլիզ է բուլատ տա չամորջենիլատ մոյի ազրեպա։ Ա� Սապջոտա սինամդուլի ամ սիստեմաշից խովրեմիս շինագան պարադոքս սատանադոտ դվերխսնիս։ Իսվ էր ոգործ ոս Սապջոտա մոգալակի սաղծերիսած գամուղեն է բուլի շավտետրի դա դիկոտոմիուրի լոգիկան։ � Սա ամավդրովուլա դրոգոր էցի նաղմ դեգեպա սազուկադոյպիս ես նացիլի, դա եմ որ չիլոս արսեպուլ ծալավուպլեպրիվ գերծ։ Ութանաստորովիս դոմինանդ ուրի ախսնիս գան կասխովիտ, իսկ կրետիկուլ Ավրմոցից ութի գոգնայում մողսեն է բատ, դա շեմ դեկ կակ ուստրով գիտխովիստուստա դիսկուսիստ, ես մատ լոբա։ Սորի որ նատ սպիկին ճարջին, այս այդ ես մայ ենգլիշ, այս այդ ես մայ ենգլիշ, այս այդ ես մայ ենգլիշ, այս Yeah, the title is given here, so I want to develop on this. My major aims are as follows. Yeah, so as in the title, I would like to answer the question, what was post-socialism and how certain categories of social groups, class, national, etc., are invented, yeah, and then circulated in public discourses and how we do uh, how we do use them, or how they are used in order to get power, money, <laughs> and uh, control over the society. And then something that uh, Narkiza has mentioned already, how certain categories of ours and them have been evolving in the post-socialism. Mm -hmm. And I use the case of Poland. I am not an expert on the Caucasus. I have I told it to the organizers and they accepted it. So as an anthropologist, I am using a sort of a case study, but I think, I hope you will make some, uh, some cross-references. And last but not least, 
Yeah. Why the promised land of capitalist heaven have turned out to be the hell of populist, nationalist, and xenophobia? Something that we witness today in many regions, not only in the Caucasus, but also in Central Europe, or in, or maybe not post socialism, but in other parts of the world, this nationalism and populism, uh, like Trumpism and etc., are quite renowned. This is the structure, which is, I could reduce it to three points, but I will somehow keep to it. And let me, we well, partly read, partly make some comments. The first part is what was socialism, how it ended. The end of history. Yeah? In a flash of triumphant optimism for democracy and the market economy, the disappearance of the Soviet bloc was supposed to signify Francis Fukuyama's notorious end of history, in which, I quote, there will be no further development of basic principles and social institutions for all relevant problems, for all relevant problems will have found their solution. Although Fukuyama's argument was much more complicated, the audience recognized that the farewell to political communists did not indeed mark the end of history and the general acceptance of general democracy. The later, somewhat in fashion of Winston Churchill's creed, may be not the ideal system, but it nevertheless is the best that has been invented. Fukuyama's radical stance on the subject made the book famous, but it was not only its author who realized that the historical process could not, just like this, stop. So what kind of revolution it was, 1981 or 1991, 92? What actually happened then and the, years follow, or in the years that followed? Was it a revolution or an accelerated evolution? Could it have been a revolution at all? Since, as one of my informants, a carpenter by professor, claimed during my ethnographic research, and I quote him, without beheadings is there a revolution? The resolution to this question makes uh, more than academic, just academic sense. For it turns out that to this day, more than three decades after the revolution, there are still political debates about what actually happened then. Zygmunt Bauman distinguished between two types of revolution, political and systemic. The political consists only of a change in the style of governance of society without violating its rules. So let's say in the Soviet Union or in the satellite states, there were various kinds of, uh, of uh, reforms, uh, etc. A systemic revolution transforms social economic structures. In this sense, the anti-communist upheaval was a systemic revolution. The old system was overthrown and a new economic and political system based on different principles was set in motion. One can go, as David Mason suggests, one step further. Fundamental system change alone does not yet meet the criterion of a systemic revolution. In this view, not only was communism overthrown, the economy reformed and the functioning of societies and the geopolitical map changed. There was also a transformation of consciousness, a transformation of people, a change in their identity. And it is only the later kind of change that makes it clear that there was a systemic revolution. What was post-socialist in a class and capital perspective? I hold that the historical process of social transformation that took place in post-communist regions, one of its crucial element was the creation of the other. There is an inevitable, this is an inevitably relational process constituting the important aspects of social relations. The creation of the other takes place at different levels, from local to global global south, global north, and uh, all these categories. 
different means and tools are used in this factory of making differences. Many commentators are appalled by the return of xenophobic sentiments in post-socialist countries. I attempt to interpret them in a way that goes beyond the generally accepted patterns of culturalist interpretation and many maintain that the concept of class is still useful. Neoliberal capitalism, especially in post-socialist regions, so post-socialist neoliberal capitalism, redefines the modes of capital accumulation by expropriating the ordinary people, that is, systematically excluding them from a share of accumulated capital, produced goods and profits. This has led to the erosion of the working class concentrated in large industrial plants, but also a demolition of the nascent middle class. It has led to the emergence of precarious uh, uh, class. In some regions, mainly in poor countries with cheap labor force, direct producers are hardly allowed to share in the profits. They are exploited la labor force that is offered a minimum wage that is, this benefits the comprado class, the local capitalists, often oligarchs, whose interests are aligned with the, those of the global elite. The role of the state is limited in this system, although the degree of this limitation depends on the power and importance of the country concerned. The capacity of state organisms to influence the world system of global capitalists represents what Eric in, in the words of Eric Wolf, tactical power. In the race for investments, many states can only offer cheap labor. But ordinary people also have the tactical power. It manifests itself in local responses to the structural changes taking place. In the case of post-socialists, people have been constantly adjusting and various forms of a new post-communist social I call it post-communist socio-economic political formations emerge. Different in Eastern Europe, especially EU, now EU member states, in Central Asia, in Russian Federation, and last but not least in the Caucasus. Tactical power of people is seen also when they simply decide to follow the capital and wealth, that is, migrate to rich capital centers. In other words, Every institutional and individual actor has a certain power to act and influence to transform local forms of capitalism. Nevertheless, it is always the product of hierarchy, hierarchically structured and relational dependencies. The grossly inequitable distribution of earned capital, expropriation by accumulation, this is David Harvey's term, leads to tensions that can take various forms, usually expressed in culture and identity politics, most often taking shape of populist, nationalist, and xenophobia. Yes, yeah, so there is a connection between these global dependencies and cultural expressions of these dependencies and the way people conceptualize it and try to try to fight them or to, to somehow to, 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 to find their place in this and to explain what's going on. And very often this is, and I'd like to connect to the subject of this conference, the nationalism and xenophobia. Let me move to the second point, creating people and their categories in post-socialism and after. And this, I have to make some remarks that, well, part and parcel of any social life is the creation of the categories, various categories, of the others, of us, but also of the groups of the people, or classes of people. And this is a normal practice and which is called intellectual containment. Yeah? That, that we try to conceptualize the social life and we invent categories. In statistics, 
categories are also invented, yeah? Or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We we have the notion of class. We have the notion of others of uh, religious categories or nationalist categories, ethnic categories. These are all categories that we do invent and through which we perceive the world, and they are produced. And some of them are popular, and some of them die out. Yeah, but this is this is a, a constant uh, constant practice. And then, well we can ask a question why some categories are popular and are a function and some do not. Well, maybe it can be explained with Pierre Bourdieu's words about structural constructivism. Yeah, that there has to be some relationship between these categories and the social reality out there. If philosophically we can somehow envisage it that there is reality out there. Because reality, we always see reality through our lenses of these categories. But they, yeah, there are different forces that try to change these categories. So, creating a new people. The creation of people capable of living in a new economic, social, political, cultural formation, known as a neoliberal capitalist and liberal democracy, constitute a sine qua non of the system emergence and perpetuation. Neoliberalism, like any kind of society's design, creates its, its vision of human beings. However, it is not to do, it does not do so in such an openly, openly blatant, intrusive, and oppressive way as communists did. The power of neoliberal order manifests itself in its capillary form, this dispersed, permeating thought, behavior, and action. We become neoliberals, in a sense, without even realizing this. It is not imposed, you know, by police, and well, of course it can, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's beneath the skin, yeah? It is invisible, and at, at the same time, time omnipresent. In the name of, new, of liberal principles, protecting the sovereign, sovereignty of the individual, and I have nothing against it, on the surface, it is neither commands, it, it ne neither com commands nor prohibits. Nevertheless, through hegemonic discourses, repeat, repeated like a mantra in the media, in school, curricula, in everyday conversations, and in the academic, in academic articles, acceptable attitudes and actions are defined and given the status of rational obviousness. This is obvious. This is the way we should, we should act. Work for 18 hours a day, for instance, because the best never rests, for instance. Nicholas Rose speaks of the creation of the enterprising self, an individual who manages himself or herself. The economic logic of the capitalist enterprise is extended to self-managing individuals, us. In neo neoliberal capitalism, the individual doesn't enjoy, uh, uh, does enjoy personal freedoms, freedom of speech, religion, to a much greater, greater extent than under real socialism. But at the same time, he or she is entirely responsible for his or her fate in a precarious world. For instance, the absence of work or its permanent insecurity is supposed to be the norm. It was not so under socialism. The state job was granted. Regardless of the structural conditions, everyone, in accordance to the proverb, as you make your bed, bed so you sleep, it is expected, one is expected to manage himself or herself in such a way that she or he sleeps good. Being employed or unemployed is the sole responsibility of the individual and not systemic unemployment caused by economic policy and global competition. People are to blame, not the system. The discredited of socialist wo women and men in order to create a new neoliberal man, the socialist men and women had to be discredited. In the spirit of this neoliberal ideology, perceptions of social inequalities were restructured. 
the reckless reclassification of people who mainly concern mainly concerned workers and agricultural workers, who were the first to feel the negative effects of the reform. It is enough to mention that, in the case of Poland at least, 70% of all unemployed in Poland in 1993 were workers. They were marginalized in the new system, and their fate was explained by something that Nargiza has mentioned by laziness, lack of innovation and inflexibility. In a sense, they were said to be poor because they were stupid. According to the yet another proverb, why you are poor? Because you are stupid. And why you are stupid? Because you are poor. This is a classical strategy, again, of blaming victims. Moreover, the so-called losers of transition were reproached for holding back necessary reforms. As an economics professor, one of the champions of neoliberal reforms argued, it was, I quote, the large industrial proletariat that became the bastion of resistance to market capitalism. When it became apparent that the price of good work was submission to capitalist work standards, its representatives turned against change. They stopped in the process of evolution towards capitalist normality. And I am reciting something that had been translated into Georgian. This, thus, the concept of famous Homo Sovieticus was created, denoting people who, although living in the capitalist world, were de facto stuck in the bygone era of real socialists and therefore useless in the new realities. They shared an old demanding attitude, yeah, were incompetent, and their mental constellation was resistant to change. Their opposition to the injustices supposedly confirmed their misunderstanding of the situation and showed how post-communist at heart they were. Paradoxically, by actively questioning the neoliberal order through strikes and demonstrations, the workers defending their, their jobs were supposedly proving that they were post-socialist dinosaurs incompatible with the new neoliberal world. Yeah, so the, 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 the mechanism is quite, quite simple. Yeah? You don't like the, what's going on, you resist it, and you are blamed, well, you see, you have proven that you don't understand what's going on, and you do not fit into this society because you resist it. And this is normality. This is how normal human behaves. And if you oppose it, that means that you belong to the past. Yeah? With time, the image of failed transformation as a result of the endurance of bad. I should start with bad. With time, the image of failed transformation as a result of the endurance of rally, relics of socialists lost its power to explain social divisions. At least in the case of Poland, the improving, uh, the improving economic situation inevitably linked to the, link to the membership of, uh, in the European Union caused social divisions to be created by, by factors other than the legacy of communism. Although the motive of post-communist mentality did not disappear completely, it receded into the background in the division of people into better and worse, modern and traditional, pro-Western and lagging behind. Yeah? So, of course, the, the concept of Homo Sovieticus did not disappear overnight. It is still there until today, but some other factors started to play a more significant role. There has then been a metamorphosis of perceptions of social divisions. The more broadly understood culture that the people in question represent has become a factor that allows discriminations, discrimination against the subjugation. The relationship to the West, liberal lifestyles, and cultural values imagined as Western has become an important reference point in the formation of attitudes and identities. An era of a new cultural wars started. The post-communists of the discriminated uh, 
lower classes hitherto expressed by the category homo sovieticus has been replaced by several other categories. So, the new heirs to post-socialism. In the plethora, I'm going to use my PowerPoint. In the plethora of terms, a new descriptor, I am talking about Poland, maybe you find some references in other, here. Uh, a new descriptor, Moher Boretz, uh, became popular. Yeah, and the categories that I am using are also popular categories, because, uh, so to say, as an anthropologist, I am not inventing only categories, scientific categories, that, you know, synthesize the wisdom of the society, but I think that what, what people do, how people do conceptualize the life is also a, a, a good point of reference of something that, 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 that is a, a food to thought, at least, yeah? It refers to people mostly living in the provinces, identified with a certain Catholic conservative, Radio Maria. Uh, they are, these people are conservative in their outlook, supporters of right-wing political groups, most often anti-European. In the opinion of the metropolitan elites, who perceive themselves as modern, their distinctive feature is the unfashionable, trashy way of dressing in particular, the knitted, knitted mohair beret worn by elderly ladies, hence the ridiculous name. The term mohair beret has never acquired the same significance as homo sovieticus. Yeah? The homo sovieticus was taken over by sociologists and used as a category that started to function as, a, as this intellectual containment. You see, there is a group of people that we can name Homo Sovieticus, and it's real, because they are there, yeah? Moher Barret is popular, but it has never been used in the literature described, but never used as a, an explanatory uh, category. Uh, but it is, as I said, used and in this uh, popular... Uh, yeah, this is... Just an example, these people were ridiculed. Or there is a cabaret. Yeah, so they, these people were simply ridiculed all the time. Moher Barret also lived to see its mutations. The new categories referred to groups of heirs of Moher Barrets were invented in popular discourses. However, what is invariably at stake is the plebeian nature and backwardness they represent. The first of this generation spanning category of, it's in Polish, Janusze and Grażyny, these are given names. Metaphorically speaking, Bills and Suzes in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, in English, I don't know, maybe you have such names which are also ridiculed somehow uh, in, in Georgian. The term has found its way into the dictionary of national academic publishers. Janusz denotes a primitive person, primitive, representing a small town mentality, watching TV incessantly with beer in hand. Grazina, Janusz Janusz's partner, a life partner, is a simple-minded person who loves shopping and gossiping. Janusz and Grażyna's descendants are Seba and Karina. Met metaphorically, chats and stasis. Uh, in the past, very uncommon names. Now, very common. That's, that's true. That's true. Seba may be also referred to as a tracksuit. Hoodie, riser, chaff, has a shaved head and is a typical neighborhood sneaker. Karina, Seba's girlfriend or wife, dresses in shiny things, has a blank head and a taste for simple music. They, they both dine on crisps and kebabs. Janusz's and Grażyna's and Seba's and Karina's embody cultural, inf cultural inferior despised 
and ridiculed groups. Moreover, their creation points to a thoroughly social problem. The groups that carry such discredited traditions in the eyes of self-appointed elites are most often marginalized in the imagined hierarchy of society. Yeah? Elites tried to, to create such a hierarchy. They, ridic uh, they, they are ridiculed by the educated and modern is a case of classism. The distancing of some social groups from others. It is also a continuation, a generationally updated successive edition of the divisions of society into liberal and conservative parts, an articulation of the division into supposed middle class and mohair berets, into homo sovieticus and homo occidentalis, the enlightened and the unenlightened, the cosmopolitan and the parochial. The discriminatory categorization never stops. Now, the third point, from post-socialist to nationalist uh, populism. But social groups, they resist such categorization and such hierarchies. That's, that's another uh, historical truth. <laughs> okay. So far, so good. All identification processes are not only relational, where uh, one identity defines another, but also imply a dialectic of domination and resistance. Groups classify, classified as subordinate can resist symbolic violence and actual subordination. There are always politicians articulating their views and interests of these groups. Yeah? Thus, people's resistance to hegemony and domination can be transformed into someone else political capital. There are various elites and they play the game of you know, winning the support of the people in the quasi-democratic or democratic systems. Uh, through appropriate interventions, politicians are thus able to give, the dis uh, give dispersed discontent uh, a compact form, helping to transform groups of disconnected people from existing in themselves, in sich, for themselves, an sich, to use Karl Marx's words. As a result, the frustrated become, become aware of their positioning in the social structure and the interests that, that they are able to defend. Since the beginning of the transformations, transformation attempts have been made to mobilize the electorate of the excluded from the mainstream but they have not always been successful for politicians claiming to represent them. However, in all the years after 1989, the current resistance to hegemonic neoliberal and cosmopolitan discourses did not die down. In, 2000, in the 2015, I'm talking about Poland, presidential and parla parliamentary elections right-wing and populist politicians succeeded by preaching precisely the slogans of defense of the excluded, the robbed, the deprived of dignity, values, and usefulness. There were, there were many reasons for these processes. Here I focus on identity-related ones. Groups that have been discursively discriminated for two and a half decades, yes, so all these Januszes and Grażynas, Homo Sovieticus, etc., were offered an ideological program, political program, ennobling their own parochial identity. As a result of the democratic elections in 2015, the previous roles of the hegemons, elites, and subordinates, subalterns, were reversed. The people now called sovereign have been called the salt of the earth. They are the ones who are supposed to defend it against foreign influences, according to the definitions of uh, political scientists. This is indeed a right-wing and populist agenda. I know that the terms are very, I mean, very problematic, but I cannot get into it. 
Uh, right, and I quote uh, uh, Saxer and German scholar, right-wing populist promises to return to the people, uh, to return to the people the power appropriated by oligarchic elites and to defend the vulnerable against the forces of globalization, unquote. Power, we should add, understood also as symbolic domination. In the new setup, it is the cosmopolitan elites and hitherto privileged groups who are placed outside the mainstream of society, condemned for their hermeticism, nepotism, their leftism and elitism, and their lack of patriot patriotism. They are portrayed as disconnected elites of the neoliberal transformation and are contrasted with true patriots and the bearers of national values. Such a treatment requires a narrative glorifying of an organic and homogeneous national community, giving resistance to the forces of evil originating in political and, uh, and worldview liberalism and economic neoliberalism. Just as in the first decades after 1999-91, pejorative terms were used to describe the losers of transformation so now former elites are stigmatized. Advocates of cultural alien liberalists have become internal enemies created in control by the power holders uh, of the media and hegemonic discourses. The emphasis of the distinction between self and other has sh shifted from terms referring to a mentality that poses a threat to modernization efforts to terms referring to a threat to national identity and integrity. Those who are described as supporters, not of a true national community, but of imaginary community of the European Union and everything foreign, cosmopolitan and left wing are excluded. They are bad guys now. In the same year of 2015, an additional factor emerged that established that establishes this type of identity relationship. Yeah, there are many, many things going on. These are the multitudes of refugees from Middle East who have begun to arrive in Europe in large numbers. In the discourses of right-wing populists, they are no longer just our internal others, those neoliberal elites living in society, but real aliens embodying evil, threatening our national existence and, uh, uh, and identity. They are culturally distant to such an extent that in a vision of the, na of a nation, of the nation imagined as homogeneous whole, they cannot be accepted. Yeah? And we are talking about Poland, which is so different from the situation in the Caucasus. It used to be a very homogeneous society after World War II, after you know, these, all these resettlements, uh, yeah, Hitler and Stalin, in a, in a sense, working together. They became an object, object of discursive creation of the ruling right-wing populists interested in consolidating their electorate around national and religious values. This treatment was used against during the events on the Polish-Belarusian border that started in 2021 and continues to this day. Last week there were elections and these, all these images were used very, very, all the time they were circulated. And the moral panic, the fear against immigrants from the alien distant countries, not from Ukraine, were raised, but also then also from Ukraine. But there is also other side to the, uh, of the coin. Discursively created aliens are included in the processes of forging internal enemies who, in a spirit of tolerance, want to welcome them. So again, yeah, they are used as, a, as uh, immigrants or these refugees are used as, a, oh, they are such a lover and they, you know, and these are these, these internal others. Yeah, so there is an interconnection, yeah? we are okay. The attitude to refugees supposedly shows who is a patriot and who is a liberal cosmopolitan. 
and final step. Others in transition as a product of neoliberal transformation. So I try to connect this. The more than three decades that have passed since 1989 have been the product of various factors operating at several levels. As I said, global, regional, and local. The social classifications produced are relational, dialectical, and interdependent, and are constantly evolving. History never stops. Their content is determined on the one hand by existing perceptions of social groups singled out, and on the other hand, by changing political and economic context. In this sense, the invented categories are derived from relations of power and domination, discursive struggles between groups vying for influence. The more powerful form and disseminate, uh, the more powerful form and disseminate their ideas, idea of social relations, which becomes hegemonic. This is Gramscian, yeah, <laughs> sort of view. The categories of thought that are invented co-create social reality. Yeah? So this is not just a discourse. This discourse somehow influences the way we see what's going on around us. Through the prism of these categories, we see and understand society, its divisions and hierarchies. Guided by them, we act in different ways in relation to people considered to represent particular categories. In the first period after 1989, the reifying notion of homo sovieticus was transport, uh, transposed onto excluded social groups, which were supposed to embody the negative characteristics that characterized the classic communist men and women. Interestingly, the colloquial, oh, I, sh I said it, okay. The losers of the transformations thus invented have been replaced over time by Mohair Barrett's a mutation of which is a category of Janusz and Grażyna and their offspring, offsprings, Seba and Karina. And then there is another yeah, category that I have not presented here, Brian and Jessica. Yeah? So these are English names that many po Polish migrants give to their children and written in a, actually in a Polonized version, yeah? Brian and Jessica, the names <laughs> that have never been used. All of them are also negatively characterized and are supposed to express provincial tra traditionalism. In reaction, the exponents of discredited groups, law and justice, party Kaczynski, for instance, losers of the transformation, and I, and I, oh, sorry, too, too early, uh, unable to, uh, to keep up with uh, uh, modernity, coined the self-definition definitions of true Poles and patriots, yeah? and this is what populists use, which are supposed to counterbalance to cosmopolitan elites and leftists. In the process of establishing such dichotomies, the aliens, Muslim refugees, representing the extreme opposite of national, religious, and cultural identification played a significant role. This classification, by the way, is about depreciating people different from ourselves as deserve, deserving contempt for one reason or the other. There are not only battles to gain a position of cultural hegemon, but also of political power, and in consequence, an access to money and all resources. Yeah, and the, the populist government in Poland, at least, has tried very hardly to build uh, its own oligarchy system. Hopefully it will somehow end up for some time. History never steps. The natural tendency of the people to map social space is thus used as a weapon to the quest for political domination. This is just from my... This is a mapping of this. <laughs> So different means and tools are used in the factory of difference. In this lecture, I have focused on the cultural aspect. But at a deeper level, the notion of class turns out to be even more relevant. Class differentiation links, to a, lot, uh, links a lot to the wave of nationalist sentiment. The inequitable distribution of earned capital obviously leads to, leads to tensions. The reaction to real degradation for instance, reduction in living standards, 
and symbolic degradation, the cultural depreciation discussed above, can take two basic forms. Both are cultural defined responses to the intensification of the creation of social inequalities. Resistance to such processes was immediately labeled a relic of Soviet mentality and a manifestation of populism. Something commonly called populism has indeed arrived, but in a different and much more dangerous form, as it is spiced with elements of nationalism, racism, and xenophobia. Where does this populism come from? Oh gosh, I am. It can be looked at in the way that most researchers who explain social phenomena by culture do. Globalization entails processes of dissemination of phenomena that are usually called McDonaldization or Americanization. The reaction of many societies, for example, the vote for Brexit, is sometimes explained by the fear of losing one's own culture. The preservation of identity and attachment to an ethnic community is supposed to be a reaction to the fear of cultural disinheritance. Contemporary European cultural fundamentalism is as a correlate of globalization with its cultural expansion and fears of the influ influx of multitudes of immigrants who, in the opinion, opinion of national thinkers who thus share a rarefied image, image of culture, threaten the identity of indigenous inhabitants of this land. We want Germany to be German, or the same goes for Poland or, or Italy, etc. In fact, such wars, it is thus a matter of aforementioned cultural wars, but, uh, but is it only that? In fact, such wars are rather a symptom of unresolved social tensions the unfulfilled aspiration of various social groups, the unfair reconfiguration in the view of many of a social structure that is changing under the influence of economic processes occurring simultaneously at local, national, European, and global levels. Globalization has until recently been associated with neoliberal economics. Within its framework, elites create a global network of connections and solidarity, while ordinary people reach for the notion of community, particularly the nation. Nation as a safe heaven, yes. Such polarization turns out to be an integral part of a system in which the crisis of culture is an epiphenomenon of the social crisis caused by the operation of capitalism. Emotions, uh, of job insecurity and precarity are expressed in cultural Indians. Yeah? Excluded by the compradors of neoliberalism and the legitimizers of Homo Sovieticus, dispensable people have become easy fodder for ideologies that explain their predicament by an internal and an external threats. And selfish elites at home and cultural alien refugees threatening national integrity. Right-wing, I, I know, right-wing populist promises to return to ordinary people the power appropriated by elites and to defend the vulnerable from the forces of globalization and protect them from aliens, mostly Muslims. It proclaims that it will usher in order, law, and justice build a national cocoon of homogenized self-confidence. Thus, populist discourse is a breeding ground for the economically and socially excluded, those harmed by globalization, but, it's, but, also, but, it, but also for supporters of traditional values, defenders of Christianity and the white race. This whole machine of discursive creation is aroused and managed by a new generation of politicians. Divisions are constructed in terms of a merely legitimate nationalists whose critics are the enemies of the, pe uh, the people. Last two paragraphs. How can this rising tide of nationalism be interpreted? As Patterson writes, populism, I quote, is a rational response to growing inequality 
and the inability to formulate a credible economic policy to challenge neoliberalism, unquote. There is no point, then, in shunning populists, challenging them to be racist and xenophobes or, ho or homophobes and sexist. Indeed, indeed, it is the politics eroding the working class and middle class that contributes to the rise of right-wing populism. It is not the people, but, but in the people, but in the system in which they come to operate that the crux of the problem lies. The search for solutions for a socially just system is the main challenge of our time. Part of its solidarity with all the excluded, including migrants, especially those fleeing war, death, and hunger. It is therefore as much a duty to critically expose the mechanism of the global system as it is to show the hopelessness, cynicism, disgust, disgustingness of right-wing populism, which does not solve problems, but only provides spurious, spurious ideologies for desperate people. So it is not enough to discredit these people who are populists. So is history over as Fukuyama wanted to be? Of course not. How did it turn out? If we try to answer this question in a single sentence, we can say that from the authoritarian communist hell, we have passed through the purgatory of democratic reforms with its fraud, with difficulties, uh, uh, of economic neoliberalism through which we arrive, contrary to what was assumed, to not a paradise capitalist, uh, uh, not to a, par a capitalist paradise, but back to the to a, at hell, saturated with false prophecies, this time of nationalist, cultural fundamentalists, with its religious overtones and in some countries, authoritarianism. Historical experience shows it, it to be the most horrible of all those we know. And that proposed by modern populists may prove to be an even more dangerous and tragic hybrid of social, political, and cultural dreams. Thank you.